be alive good evening all welcome to i focus online the 337th episode the 12th in the ocular positive module today we have with us dr mukesh sharma sir from center for site jaipur to speak to us on blepharophimosis syndrome the evaluation classification and its management dr mukesh sharma received his education in mbbs from sms jaipur and his post graduation in fellowship in ocular plastic and pediatric ophthalmology from the prestigious all india institute of medical sciences new delhi he is currently the medical director for center for sight jaipur formerly he served as the associate professor in the department of ophthalmology sms medical college jaipur he has had positions at various levels in various organizations and to name a very few of them he was the general secretary to the opai from 2016 to 2018 and again from 2018 to 2021 general secretary for the rajasthan ophthalmic society from 2016 to 2019 is a principal investigator icma project corneal epithelial stem cell culture and transplantation he was a chairman of scientific committee rajasthan ophthalmic society secretary to the jaipur ophthalmic society he has numerous awards for his presentations in various national and international conferences and has 27 publications to his credit he has performed live surgeries at various forums across the country it is indeed a pleasure to have you sir today with us and over to you for the lecture thank you uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be a part of uh, this prestigious eye focus program and at the outset i am thankful for uh, dr santosh onawar and team eye uh, focus for giving me this opportunity so today we shall be discussing this rather uncommon condition i'm sorry which is known as blepharophimosis syndrome or bpes so my slides are visible i hope all right so blepharophimosis syndrome uh, just a sec yeah it is also known as con romano syndrome and it is classically a tetrad of severe bilateral ptosis and uh, yeah phimosis or narrowing of horizontal palpable fissure telecanthus which is uh, basically widely spaced to canthi and epicanthus inversus so these four are the major features of blepharophimosis syndrome severe bilateral ptosis phimosis or narrowing of horizontal palpable fissure telecanthus and epicanthus inversus we shall discuss all of them in detail in uh, uh, just a while later this is also known as bpes this is a mnemonic where b stands for blepharophimosis p for ptosis e for epicanthus inversus and s for syndrome so this is also known as bpes now there are certain other minor features along with these major features these minor features are not mandatory part of vps but they may be there in some of the cases in this unique condition we may have atropion of lateral part of lid and entropion of medial part of lower lid so in one lid you may have entropion and atropion both you can see here in this particular photograph lateral part of lower eyelid is having atropion while medial half of lower eyelid is having entropion so this is a very unique condition that way patient may have strabismus in this particular patient left eye is having esotropia there is an association of thick high arch brows you can see these eyebrows are quite thick and high arch also there may be superior orbital rim hypoplasia hypertelorism may be there in some of the cases in hypertelorism you have widely spaced bony orbits also there may be widened nasal bridge as it is there in this photograph in some of the patients you can have low pier or antiverted ears like this you can see this ear is antiverted moving downward so this is known as low pier so this also may be there in some of the patients now classically bps is of two types this was given by lotogra et al in type 1 bps you have got all these classic facial features along with primary ovarian failure 
while in type 2 pps there is no systemic association of ovarian dysfunction you have only the facial uh, features in primary ovarian failure there may be signs of ovarian failure like initially patient may have normal menarcheal this may be followed up by loss of menses before 40 years, decreased fertility and other symptoms associated with hypoestrogenism. So you must know and we must ask for history, at least in female patient, because if patient is having sign of this, then it is our earnest duty to refer patient to endocrinologist so that a timely treatment can be started and patient can uh, be relieved from all these symptoms. The prevalence of BPS varies like in different studies. In one of the studies, it is quoted as 1 in 50,000 birth. But uh, in many other studies, like it is reported as quite a rare condition. One important finding is that up to 75% of affected individuals, they can have this Fox L2 mutation. This Fox L2 mutation is in chromosome 3 short arm Q at 23 band. This is said to be responsible for BPS. And this single gene is also expressed in ovaries. So that's why you can have association of ovarian dysfunction along with lid problem and facial problem in BPS. And this is very important genes, Fox L2 genes. So now we come to the actual examination part of blepharophimosis syndrome. See, it is a kind of complicated ptosis. So all the pertinent examination point of ptosis, they are also relevant in BPS or blepharophimosis syndrome. Along with that, there are other specific points. So I'll be discussing only those specific points which are pertinent to BPS rather than going to all ptosis examination chart. So in blepharophimosis syndrome, as we discussed initially, it is a tetrad of four findings. One is phimosis or blepharophimosis, which is horizontal shortening of palpable fissure. So to, to, uh, to record this, you need to actually measure this horizontal palpable fissure. Normally, we do not do it in our ptosis examination, but in BPS, you need to do it. Normal fissure is around 25 to 30 mm. While in BPS, it is less than 25 mm, roughly around 20 mm. So this is one important finding. Then you have to measure the ptosis, which is the second cardinal point of lepophimosis syndrome. Ptosis is generally severe with very poor levator function. And uh, this levator function is poor because of uh, levator dysplasia. Levator muscle is very poorly developed in these uh, individuals. So there is very poor levator function. And also peculiarly in this condition, there is shortened anterior and posterior lamina with very tight lids. So here there is shortening of skin is also there. Hardly you will have any overhanging lid fold. You can create a little bit of lid crease with your surgery. But overhanging lid fold will not be possible because of shortened skin. And because these lids are very tight, so correction with silicon rod is suboptimal. We shall see this point little later on when we will be discussing the management part. So this is important to know that there are uh, very tight lids in this particular condition because of shortened anterior and posterior lamina both. Now we come to the telecanthus part, measurement of telecanthus. There is, what is telecanthus? Increased distance between two medial canthi. So this is known as telecanthus. And with this, there is uh, an association of elongated medial canthal tendon. So whenever we are correcting telecanthus, we shorten the medial canthal tendon either by non-absorbable suture or by stainless steel suture. We shall again discuss this a little later on. So there are a few measurements which are important. One is intercanthal distance, ICD. The other is IPD, interpupillary distance. And then there is a ratio of IPD and ICD. In a normal individual, this ratio is more than two. What do you understand by more than two? Suppose IPD is 50 millimeter, then ICD should be less than 25 millimeter in normal individual. 
So if you divide 50 by say 22, 23, whatever is there less than 25, then it this ratio would be more than two. So this is the normal ratio. What happens in telecanthus is, primary telecanthus is that this distance increases. So because of increase in this distance or ICD, the ratio get reversed. So suppose IPD is 25 millimeter, then in blepharophimosis syndrome, the ICD would be anything more than 25. So if you divide 50 with 28, if it is ICD is 28, then the ratio would be definitely less than 2. I hope I am clear on it. Then this telecanthus is again divided into primary telecanthus and secondary telecanthus. What is primary telecanthus? Primary telecanthus is basically a soft tissue variant of telecanthus. The anomaly is only there in soft tissue. And this is what we get in blepharophimosis syndrome. What is secondary telecanthus? If a patient is having hypertelorism, what do you mean by hypertelorism? These two bony orbits are widely spaced apart. So hypertelorism is basically a skeletal problem, not a soft tissue problem these two orbits are widely spaced apart. So what will happen in secondary telecanthus or hypertelorism? The ICD will increase, but also the IPD. So both will increase and the ratio will remain the normal. So ratio will be again more than two, but I, absolute value of IPD and ICD both will increase. So this is how you differentiate between primary telecanthus and secondary telecanthus, which is due to hypertelorism. Then the fourth cardinal point of blepharophimosis syndrome is epicanthus inversus. What is epicanthus inversus? It is a skin fold running from medial part of lower eyelid to the upper eyelid. So you can see here also, this is the ep epicanthal inversus fold. And what is there in epicanthus? Skin fold runs from upper lid to lower lid. But in BPS, we get epicanthus inversus, not the epicanthus. At any time, if I am not clear, you can interrupt me and ask me. Now, blepharophimosis syndrome is also inherited and it has got autosomal dominant inheritance. It runs in families. Vertical transmission is there as it is there in any other autosomal dominant disease. So you can see these two families there. This photograph is very interesting photograph. These two boys are there with their father. And in this next photograph, this is 20, there is an interval of 20 years between those, these two photographs. This photograph is taken 20 years later. These two boys, they have turned into adult. And this is the child of this gentleman. So now we are having three generations in these two photographs. Father, who has bought their two sons for treatment to me. And then I have operated both these boys. These are photographs 20 years post-op. And now this particular gentleman, he has bought his son, who is also unfortunately having this the same condition for his treatment. So uh, there is a mixed kind of feeling when you get such patient. One, obviously, you feel good that the patient has got so much of confidence that their uh, second generation, they have bought uh, for treatment to the same surgeon. So this actually is uh, very, very gratifying. And these are prized photographs for any surgeon. But secondly, these photographs also make you feel old. Like you have become so old that you are treating generation after generation. So this is another aspect. So yet another family of BPS, father along with his two sons. Now we talk about the surgical protocol of BPS. So in blepharophimosis and syndrome, Generally, what is postulated is two-stage surgery. In two, and when we do surgery, ideal age is three to five years. When the child becomes three to five years old, results are good if we operate at around five years because tissue development becomes a little better during this time. 
but generally parents like educated parents they want to get uh, their child operated at a school going age so nowadays we are operating them at around three years or so so when we do surgery in two stages in first stage we do medial canthoplasty for epicanthus inversus and telecanthus and lateral canthoplasty for phimosis part and as second stage we do frontalis suspension for ptosis and that is done after 6 to 12 months there are proponent of single stage surgery also in this everything is done together ptosis and medial canthoplasty problem with this is that you have got vertical and horizontal stretching together because medial canthoplasty causes horizontal stretching while process correction causes vertical stretching. So two pulls in opposite direction, they limit their effect. So that's why you do not get sufficient correction in canthoplasty also, and you do not get sufficient correction for tosis also. So we prefer that uh, this surgery should be done as two stage. Now, appropriate age, we have already discussed three to five years. But if pupil is getting covered and if there are chances of amblyopia, amblyopia is threatened, then obviously we try to operate as early as possible. And again, in these cases, we do two stage surgery. First stage silicone sling is done as maybe as a temporary measure to prevent amblyopia. For canthoplasty, one can wait for some time till the tissue development become better. So what are the treatment options in blepharophimosis syndrome? As we discussed in stage one, which is preschool age, nowadays we are doing it at three to four years. Medial canthoplasty along with lateral canthoplasty is done. There are, there are various ways of doing medial canthoplasty, which we'll discuss all of them in little detail later on. So one is CU plasty, then YV plasty, then double jet plasty. And in all of them, medial palpable ligament shortening is also done. And this correct telecanthus along with epicanthus inversus. Lateral canthoplasty corrects phimosis of horizontal palpable fissure. And stage two frontalis sling, this corrects severe bilateral doses. So what are the ways of doing medial canthoplasty? One is YV plasty. This was given by Vervis. So what is done here is an incision in the shape of Y is made like this. And then these excessive skin, they are triangles are resected. And this Y is converted into V. So these two triangles of skin along with subcutaneous tissue and along with some amount of orbicularis. So these all things are resected and this Y is converted into V. So by doing this, what you are doing is that you are shifting your medial cancers by this distance, by the limb of Y, vertical limb of Y. So this much amount of displacement of medial canthus can be theoretically achieved. Generally, it should not be more than six to seven millimeter in one eye because beyond that, if you do, then there, the subcutaneous tissue do not permit you to uh, resect and reapproximate more than this. Problem with this Vervis YV plaste is that maximum pull is there at this point. So there is no uniform distribution of this medial canthus shift. There is maximum point pull at this particular point. Then there is another procedure which is known as double jet plasty. This was given by Mustardis. Here, these kind of flaps are made and they are transposed and finally it, they are sutured back. Again, there is one problem that there are tiny eight flaps in such a small uh, area, basically. So it is very difficult to manipulate and too many scar lines are there. So we do not prefer this mustardis double jet plasty also. So what I personally prefer is horn plasty CU plasty. It is a kind of YV plasty only, but the difference is that here this C is converted into U. 
so two lines are marked this intervening tissue is again resected so this is again 6 to 8 millimeter part of intervening tissue which is resected and along with this we resect tissue in curve also so there is no point pull this is uniformly distributed pull so this gives a better result cosmetically so this is our choice procedure and we are doing it routinely but there are different proponents for all these three procedures and people say that results are more or less same so there are people who do yv plasty there are people who do mustardis double jet plasty and there are people who do cu plasty for medial cancers shift so uh, uh, I'll skip this slide of our experience. So uh, how this CU plasty is done? Uh, you can see this C is marked and this will be converted into U and this intervening tissue would be resected. So this is the appearance after reception of this intervening tissue. Here we are doing transnasal wiring. So what is done is that a steel wire is passed through the medial canthus, medial canthal ligament, and a right spatial atta is, needle is taken. It is used. We have created perforated the nose here, and these two medial canthal ligaments are sutured on a single steel suture, and the knot would be buried inside this this uh, hole in the nose. I don't think we require to go into uh, minute detail of this particular procedure, but short of this uh, transnasal wiring, one can do MPL shortening by non-absorbable sutures as ethibond or as nylon or as proline. So this is the final appearance on table after doing medial canthoplasty and lateral canthoplasty. So you can see the medial pull and this pinch of uh, soft tissue area over the nasal bridge. So maximum shortening is created here and also the elongation of phimotic part by this lateral canthoplasty. Then we do the stage two ptosis correction. As we discussed earlier, these patients, they have got severe ptosis with poor levator function and underdeveloped levator muscle. So obviously, levator resection is out of the place because levator muscle itself is underdeveloped. There are a few, there is a group of persons who have attempted levator resection, but ultimately there is late droop in almost all of them. So frontalis sling is the procedure of choice. And in frontalis sling, then there are two groups. One can use artificial materials as silicone or non absorbable suture, or one can use autologous facial atta. In this particular condition, though facial atta is considered gold standard for any sling, but in blepharophimosis syndrome, it is undoubtedly superior to silicone sling and other artificial materials. Why it is so? Because in this particular condition, as I told you initially, there is very tight upper lid with shortened anterior and posterior lamina. So what happens is that if you try to lift these tight lids with silicone, then there is progressive under correction over the period because of excessive tension on sling material due to tight lid of BPS. While facial atta is very strong yet supple material, and it definitely scores over silicone in these conditions. Facial atta's elasticity is almost equal to silicone, so it is nearly same on lid leg and leg ophthalmos, and also is, it virtually eliminate problems like extrusion, foreign body granuloma, infections, lipase, etc., which may be there in any other condition also. So what happened in blepharophimosis syndrome is that resting length of artificial material which is used is very less. So basically silicone is a kind of elastic material and if you pull a tight lid 
with silicon, then the resting length of silicon, effective length of silicon, which is used is very less. It is less than 25 millimeter. We have done a small study and measured this. And while in facial lata, you use, actually you use double the length of silicon. You use more than 45 millimeter of facial lata. Because of this more resting length of sling material, there is more physiological lid uh, elevation also and lid closer also. And also it remains, uh, the effect remains there lifelong. It does not get drooped with time so easily as it is there with silicon. But there are certain problems with facial atta. You need to give a separate thigh incision, which may be cosmetically problematic for some. Definitely, there is longer duration of surgery. Generally, it is done under general anesthesia. It has got some learning curve in facial atta harvestation and strip making. And it is not possible in very young children, say less than uh, four years. That was the traditional teaching. But we are regularly doing it in child about two and a half to three years. So uh, traditionally, it used to be taken from very long open incisions, then uh, smaller incision with the help of strippers. Uh, they have been invented three to four centimeter incision, but uh, it is difficult to find the right stripper. So with some practice, we are doing manual small incision facial atta surgery. So uh, here, without using any stripper, we can retrieve good length of facial atta, which is more than 20 centimeter, uh, more than 10 centimeter. So how facial atta sling is passed? It can be passed in two way, either Crawford's double triangle, where you require two strips of facial atta per eye, or you can pass it in Fox's pentagon manner. This is the pentagon. So here one strip per eye is required and it gives very good lid lift and contour, not at all inferior to Crawford's way. So most people nowadays have shifted to Fox's pentagon. Just a sec. Yeah. So this we have already discussed. Now a brief video of uh, facial atta surgery. Just a second. I think I need to. So, incision is marked on lateral part of thigh. Yeah. Just a second, yeah. Incision is marked here. So we have made around 2.5 centimeter incision. And this is given on a line joining lateral condyle to the anterior superior iliac spine. So middle third of that line is used and uh, this incision is given. Now, after making two cuts with the help of VP knife, we are using a very long scissor and we are just first undermining the superior tissue, tissue over the facial atta, and then we are gliding the scissor and just enlarging the incision which were made initially. We are not giving any cut, we are just gliding it as the cloth when they're cut, sari or clothes. Once you have done this, the same thing is followed on other side also. Then a curved scissor is used. It is inserted inside above the facial atta and just a, a, a reverse uh, tug is made and this facial atta can be really cut with some practice. Then the same thing is followed from the other end, superior end also. 
and one can retrieve good length of facial data. What we require is 10 centimeter, but generally we are able to retrieve around 15 centimeter of facial data quite easily with some practice. So this is much more than 15 centimeter rather, which is around eight, 18 centimeter or so. So once you have retrieved the facial data strip, you cut it and you require one strip per eye. So you will have to make two uh, other strips and you need only two to three millimeter strips. So what we are making three to four, around four millimeter strips. Then you pass this as silicon rod is passed. So you mark a pentagon, two point above medial and lateral canthus. There are other finer details also. I don't think I should be going into those. So once you have made the pentagon, you make the, the stab incision with knife or you can use the pottery also. then this holding suture and then this right facial atta needle is passed and is threaded with the help of facial atta strip which we have fashioned and this will be passed like silicon rod So it is threaded, same thing is repeated. And finally, at the top of pentagon, both the ends are brought together. One knot is applied. And then one six of vitral would be applied at two end. You don't require non-absorbable suture here. And it is cut and buried. So uh, this is how it is done. Uh, aim surgery, but I just want to show you lateral canthoplasty. So at lateral canthal, you can give incision by your diathermy or by knife. And then these enlarge, uh, this thing palpable fissure would be made and this would be sutured later on. So this is how. This is the final appearance on table. So there are few of the cases. Preoperative, you can see this patient, she is there in waking up condition. And you can see the severity of ptosis. Hardly there is any palpable fissure which is there. Around 2 millimeter palpable fissure is there. So ptosis is around 8 millimeter. And this is post-op 2 years and this is post-op 15 years. And you can see even after 15 years, if you compare it with pre-operative photograph, you can see very good result. One can hardly recognize that this particular girl was having this appearance when she was born. So this is the beauty of this two-stage uh, regime. Yet uh, another patient, I have shown you this photograph earlier also. So first stage after uh, four months, then second stage, and this photograph is of six month post operative facial atta. And this is 20 years post op. Same person after 20 years. And you can see very good appearance. You can here appreciate the tightness of lid. So, in such tight lids, uh, I don't think silicone is very effective in long run. And you can see very thick, high arch brows also, which is there in blepharophimosis syndrome. He is brother of the same patient, which we have just now uh, seen. Again, post-op result and again after, uh, this is wrongly mentioned six months. This is again 20 years post-op. 
so here father with son and now this son has become father and this is his son and he has brought this patient for treatment we have done first stage surgery in this particular patient and he is waiting for now second stage surgery so yet another person there is a problem of prominent scarring with medial canthoplasty in some of the patients this scar prominent scar is there for one to two years but after some time this goes away goes away means this becomes very faint say after two years or so and also uh, you can see there is superficialness of this medial canthus this is a problem if you do if you do not do transnasal wiring if we just cut medial canthal tendon, shorten it and uh, uh, ligate it with the help of non-absorbable suture, we will not be able to impart the depth of medial canthus which is necessary. So this is a problem of not doing transnasal wiring. But if you do transnasal wiring, then there are some problems with that also. There is more chances of uh, uh, epiphora and uh, canalicular disturbance with transnasal wiring and of course the surgery duration increases by say 30 to 40 minutes. So yet another patient. You can see problem with these patient is that the lid is very tight, very tense lid is there. Even with the facial lata and toughness of facial lata, the lift is not that much which you uh, require, but again, uh, it is quite good. But with silicone, the lift is not at all comparable, at least after say two, three years. So we have done a lot of patients uh, till now. I think if, uh, in my career, I operated more than 100 patients of blepharophimosis syndrome. So to conclude, uh, a reasonably favorable outcome with two-stage regime can be achieved. As we discussed in stage one, which is done at around three years or more, CU plus T or any other medial canthoplasty along with MPL shortening. If you can do transnasal wiring, the wiring, then the results are even better. And along with lateral canthoplasty is done. In stage two, which is done after six months, facial atta sling is preferred. One can do silicone. There is no problem in silicone also, but the results are not that good. One can do a repeat lateral canthoplasty if there is uh, too much of phimosis to obtain a necessary horizontal lid laxity for ptosis correction. But if you are doing it too much, then there may be lateral canthal flare also. So you have to balance it. There are some concern also post-op epiphora is there in some of these patients due to kinking of canaliculi because you pull medial canthus so much, you pull everything towards nose. So there is kinking of canaliculi and it is more there in transnasal wiring. So post-op epiphora is a problem in some of these patients. And then, I, as I told you, natural depth of medial canthus is difficult to achieve except in transnasal wiring. But there are problems of transnasal wiring also. Prominent scar for few years may be seen in some of the patients. So it is always good that you explain realistic results to the patient. You always, you, one should tell them that you will never be able to become absolutely normal. But you will be definitely improved from what your appearance is now and you will be somewhere around 70 to 80 percent of a normal. So I think that's the fair deal which one can give to patient. So uh, I hope I am clear on my presentation. I have yes, uh, formed few of the questions also. They are based on my presentation. So is there someone to answer these? Hello, somebody is listening? Yeah, sir, the fellows are there, sir. Uh, Roju Tithi, you can go okay. ahead. Okay, fine. So uh, there are no uh, penalization. There is no penalization. And, uh, you should not be worried for this. This is, we are just 
uh, doing it for fun one can say yes sir and these questions are very simple and based on uh, the presentation which just now i have given so one question is that which is not a procedure for medial canthos canthoplasty in bps not a procedure okay mm -hmm. so choices are vy plasty double jet plasty cu plasty and none of the above Sir, uh, we do all the procedures, so maybe not of the above. Any other opinion? Double. Yeah, we do all of them. You will have to carefully observe the choices. See oh, you. yeah, the first one. Ah, <laughs> why uh, we? No, not we. So it is why we plastic, not the we why plastic. <laughs> So, <laughs> there was this catch actually. So, we make a Y and convert into V. It is not V to Y, but it is Y to B plastic. Good. Now, BPS individual, they may have mutation on which of the genes? Fox L1, L2, L3, L4. Let's see how many of you were awake during the presentation. Sir, L1. Oh, wrong. It is L2, L2 sir. L2. 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 So it is Fox L2 mutation. Okay. So this may be asked somewhere. Now, classical anomaly in BPS lower lid entropion, upper lid entropion, medial ectropion and lateral entropion of lower lid and medial entropion and lateral ectropion of lower lid. Sir, medial entropion and lateral ectropion. Correct, correct. So good. So with this, I complete my presentation and now we are open for the discussion. So uh, if, there, if there is anything which you would like to ask, I'll be happy to answer it. And do not fear or shy or do anything. We all are in same boat. So, uh... thank you so much, sir. That was a wonderful lecture, and uh, especially putting the MCQs in the end, kind of. Uh, that's really helpful. Those are some of the common questions which come. Thank you so much for such a such a comprehensive, yet clear lecture on this topic. Ruju, are there any questions on the social media? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so the first question we have is how to calculate the amount of telecanthus uh, to be corrected and uh, blepharophimosis for blepharophimosis correction. Mm -hmm. See, uh, you will have to measure first the amount of telecanthus and the amount of phimosis, which is uh, there in any given patient. Now, as I told you initially also, there is a limit of soft tissue resection which can be done in any given patient. So with all our experience, now we know that intervening tissue which you resect should not be more than 6 to 8 millimeter in one side. So if you combine both, because telecanthus is a combination, basically the effect achieved by resection on both the side, right side and left side. So if you combine both, then the effects is, suppose you have resected six millimeter on one right side, six on other. So 12 millimeter, you have soft tissue resected. But effective result would not be 12 millimeter because there will be some again relaxation. So if you are resecting 12 millimeter, you would be able to achieve 60 to 70% of the amount which you have resected. So in turn, you will be able to have six to eight millimeter of telecanthus correction. So this is the uh, maximum which one can achieve if you are not doing transnasal wiring. If one is doing transnasal wiring, then you can have little more of telecanthus correction. So the telecanthus, if it is very severe, then better to go for transnasal wiring. So this is one part of telecanthus. The second part was of phimosis or the horizontal palpable fissure. Now, the problem with phimosis correction is that again, you require some depth at lateral canthus. 
though the depth is not too much, but there is some definitely a depth which is there at lateral canthus. And if you cut too much amount of uh, tissue laterally, then there will be a lateral flare. The depth and the angle of lateral canthal will be lost. So, uh, again, the maximum amount of uh, phimosis which can be corrected is around 6 millimeter or so in per, uh, per eye, in one eye. And if you are doing a liberal lateral canthoplasty, then one has to pass a suture on boluster as we do uh, in fornix formation inferiorly. Uh, whenever we are doing socket or something like that, you have to do a fornix formation kind of suture laterally also so that the depth of lateral fornix which you want can be achieved. It is a little technical, but I hope I am clear on it. Yes, sir. Sir, is there any particular uh, mathematical formula to calculate like uh, uh, the marking for marking of the incisions and... See, uh, for double jet, uh, for uh, uh, PU plus T, I have told you that uh, intervening tissue should not be more than 6 to 8 millimeter. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, pull back the resected area nicely. So, you will have to mark a C. The initial incision of C should not be too far away uh, from medial canthus then the 6 to 8 millimeter part and then the second incision. So uh, this is the way we are doing uh, CU plasty and same is for YV plasty also. The vertical limb of Y should not be again more than 6 to 8 millimeter. And uh, one important finding is that uh, I'll, can I share my slide for a minute? Sure, sir. Because you all are budding oculoplasty people, so so this is CU plasty. So now when we suture them back we do whatever undermining is required at this side, this side only. We do not do any undermining underneath this skin area. Why it is not done? You want this area to remain fixed. You do not want this to be mobilized and come medially. Because if this area comes medially, your effort of correcting telecanthus would be jeopardized. So what we do is that we, after resecting, we do undermining underneath this skin, but not underneath this skin. And then we suture them. So I hope I'm clear on it. Yes, because sir. If you are undermining this, then you are mobilizing this, and this particular point will come here this so you don't want this point to be shifted uh, laterally so the second question we have is uh, role of transnasal wiring and uh, like uh, specifically which cases to be selected for transnasal wiring yes so i have briefly touched upon that those cases where the telecanthus is quite severe and the phimosis is really severe. Basically, wherever you want a good pull towards nose, then you want a transnasal wiring. In this particular patient, you can see a very significant telecanthus is there. And also, phimosis is also very severe. So, this particular case, we chose for transnasal wiring. While... Now, in this particular patient, the preoperative uh, telecanthus was also not that severe and phimosis was also not that severe. So, here we opted for 
non absorbable uh, medial canthal shortening with the help of non absorbable suture so this is the way one can um, uh, really differentiate between the patients okay thank you sir so the next question we have is uh, relevance of imaging in calculating the hypertellurism yes so the imaging will definitely guide you about the bony abnormality any bony abnormality if it is there and uh, in imaging you can have distances between medial orbital margin and lateral orbital margin and you can have that calculation so you will have an exact idea about the hypertellurism in imaging but uh, with your ipd and icd calculation you can also reach to the conclusion about hypertellurism so in uh, radiological imaging you will be able to know that this orbit and this orbit both of them are widely apart and the ratio of uh, uh, medial part of orbit and uh, lateral part of orbit this will not be changed the ratio would be same but the distance would be more. So, uh, next few questions we have are on suture material. So, which uh, suture you uh, prefer for uh, medial canthoplasty and uh, also for the TFS? Yes, medial canthoplasty and? TFS, sir, for temporary TFS. Okay, okay. See, for medial canthoplasty, uh, suturing is very important. You need to do suturing in two layers at least and sometime in three layers because you are resecting too much amount of intervening tissue and there will be hypertrophic scar if you have not done subcutaneous tissue well. So what I typically do is that in a deeper layer, I apply non-absolvable suture and my choice material is ethibond, 5 ethibond. Why I prefer ethibond over proline is that proline has got very, uh, you can say, tough ends. They are not very malleable and sometimes they protrude out of the incision. So I use deeper layer ethibond suturing. Above that, 6O vicryl, that is as subcutaneous tissue suturing, and then the skin sutures. In spite of doing suturing in three layers, you can have. Uh, hypertrophic kind of a scar but those scars would not be too much if you do suturing loose little loose then after some time you will have very thick hypertrophic scar because of sub irregular fibrous tissue laid down in subcutaneous tissue so you want a very good subcutaneous suturing and in two layers at least inside and one layer outside so that's about the medial canthal part and the other suturing, uh, other material uh, you ask for? Um, Temporary for, TFS, sir, uh, uh, which we do for uh, um, to prevent the amblyopia, basically. For that, suture is out now. We use silicone because it is not initially the concern was of cost, silicone cost. But now that thing is not at all there. Silicone has also become very cheap. So initially we used to do proline or ethibond suturing, but nowadays for all temporary procedure also silicone rod is used because that can be easily adjusted also in post-operative period. And if a patient is lucky, your temporary procedure may remain there lifelong also. So silicone, silastic rod only the choice. Sir, if I may just ask one question here. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in case of a very young child with severe ptosis where mm -hmm. there is risk of amblyopia, in mm -hmm. those cases, would you prefer a one-stage procedure or like still prefer a two-stage one? See, I don't do one-stage procedure, but in those cases, what I do is that I do first silicone rod. I do not okay. correct. I do not do medial canthoplasty. Because res results of medial canthoplasty in very young child is uh, like they are very suboptimal because okay. tissue around nose is not well developed, nose nasal bridge is not well developed. So you will not get adequate tightening there. So better to just uncover the pupil by okay. your celiastic rod 
and then follow up the patient and if parents demand say after two years or so for better cosmesis then do the definitive procedure in two part okay thank you sir uh sir one question i had was uh, you said about uh, you uh, like uh, mentioned about the hypertrophied scar so if if at all we have a scar over the medial canthus what are the options for scar modulation Yes, scar modulation. Nowadays, we all are using five FU for scar modulation. But if the child is quite young, less than six years of age, then obviously we are not supposed to use five FU. And uh, the the other cream scar tubex etc. Those are should not. Those also should not be used near eye because they can uh, dribble inside the eye, and there those can create chemical problems for cornea. so for that the i think the only option is to give steroid ointment also one can give vitamin e there and uh, if child becomes older say around 6 years or so then definitely 5 fu so uh, repeated 5 fu will modulate the scar and you get good uh, result okay. so a uh, few more questions are on uh, lateral canthoplasty so if you can just uh, yes it was not highlighted i think in my presentation so well so lateral canthoplasty uh, it was given by agnew the name of scientist was agnew a g n e w so agnew's lateral canthoplasty and what is done here is uh, maybe i sh can show you in uh, that video I'll so it is not at all a difficult procedure see so what is done here is here we are just trying to save the globe by this forceps only ideally you can use the eyeball protector also incision is made at lateral canthal region like this like we do canthotomy and then you if the phimosis is not too much then you do not do cantholysis you just do a canthotomy and suture it but if phimosis is very severe then you do cantholysis also you severe the upper tendon and lower tendon both and after doing that you perform your lateral canthoplasty generally we do not apply suture at this moment and it is better to do this canthoplasty before doing medial canthoplasty because once you have relaxed the lateral canthus then you will be able to shift more medial canthus uh, if you do it after doing medial canthoplasty then this medial shift would not be augmented so once you have made cut here then you do your medial canthoplasty and at the end you apply your vicryl sutures if you have done just lateral canthotomy kind of incision apply vicryl running vicryl like this if you have made liberal lateral canthoplasty by cutting both the crust of lateral canthus then again after applying suture you pass a double arm non absorbable suture from inside come out here and pass those sutures over a rubber bolster as we pass in tarsorephy or fornix formation keep this suture there for at least 3 weeks so that you can have a depth of lateral canthus and again this uh, elongation will remain there for like it will be more permanent so this is the way it is done so a smaller uh canthoplasty just make nick and resuture at the end of surgery by 60 vicryl running suture liberal lateral canthoplasty severe both the crust and then pass a non absorbable suture over rubber bolster keep it there for 3 weeks and remove it after 3 weeks so i hope i am clear on it 
Yes, sir. Thank you so much for that. So the last question we have for tonight is uh, for MCT application, what quotients to be exercised while passing the suture? Yes. So for NCT application, one is that uh, you can do application without cutting the NCT and you can shorten the MCT and then re-suture it. So if you are doing just plication as the definition of plication, you are not cutting medial canthal ligament, which is there inside from anterior lacrimal crest. And you are just plicating it by the help of a double arm non-resolvable suture. Now, the disadvantage of doing simple plication without cutting is that there will be reversibility. After some time, it will again drag down. But if you cut it and re-suture it, at, cut it, resect some part of medial canthal ligament and re-suture it at anterior lacrimal crest with the help of non-absorbable suture, then the permanent result uh, would be more, like result would be better. Now, the issue there is that you should always take precaution that your suture bites are not injuring the canaliculus and obviously you are not injuring the sac part also. Sac is little downward, but canaliculus are there in very close proximity to um, MCT. So you will have to actually visualize it and feel the MCT, which is a pearly white kind of ligament. And once you have felt it, then I cut it from a anterior canthal ligament insertion and then pass suture at quite distance from uh, bone and then try to pull it as close to anterior lacrimal crest as possible and pass those sutures in the periosteum. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, all the questions were answered in uh, uh, detail and uh, it was everything was so clear. So thank you so much, sir, for answering all our questions. And uh, before we call it a day, I have a small announcement to make. Next, we will meet on uh, September 13th, that is Wednesday, and uh, Dr. Kasturi Bhattacharji will be speaking to us on evaluation of aging phase and lower eyelid blepharoplasty. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.